Here's the follow-up video about why I believe only Blinky and Pinky behave differently in Miss Pac-Man versus the original Pac-Man, while Inky and Clyde slash Sue act the same. While that video will give you a lot of context about the topic at hand, it's not exactly a prerequisite for this one, but I will give a tiny bit of a refresher. Each of the four ghosts have a bit of code that runs each frame to tell them how to move around the maze. Here are snippets of what that code looks like for each of them during their scatter mode in the original Pac-Man. The numbers here in these instructions are the coordinates of each of the ghosts' target tiles, the tiles that they try to move towards. Each one is in a different corner of the maze, which makes them scatter to a different part of the maze. Now, in Miss Pac-Man, the code was changed to this. A special function was added that picks a random quadrant of the maze, one of four coordinates is returned from this function, which essentially randomizes the direction the ghosts travel. However, this was only implemented for Blinky and Pinky. For Inky and Sue, this function call replaced a previous instruction, but the load instruction for the old coordinates follows directly after. This means a random coordinate gets calculated, but then overwritten with the original value immediately afterwards so Inky and Sue still move to the lower two corners of the maze. There's something particular about these two snippets of code that makes them different from the first two that may be the reason, or at least a reason, why these two ghosts are different. But first we have to talk about how arcade hardware works. Here is a diagram of all of the components on the motherboard for the original Pac-Man. There are a lot of things on here, but we're only interested in these six chips here. The ICs on arcade boards are identified by their position on the board, sort of like an old-timey atlas map. So we have chips 5E, 5F, 6E, 6F, 6H, and 6J. Each of these are 4 kilobyte ROM chips. The chips in column 5 hold all of the game's graphics data, and the chips in column 6 hold all of the game's code. Now, Miss Pac-Man is basically just a modification of Pac-Man, so most of the hardware is identical. It's just some bits of the graphics and code changed. So instead of creating an entirely different motherboard for Miss Pac-Man, what if we just took all these ROM chips and replaced them with different ones? This would just convert a Pac-Man machine into a Miss Pac-Man machine. In fact, a lot of the time, these ROM chips aren't even soldered to the board, they're seated in little connectors that let you easily swap them out. In practice, this works great, but not exactly for Miss Pac-Man. It works for the graphics chips, but there was a problem with the program code. While the graphics data stayed the exact same size, the program code grew with the additions of stuff like the new mazes and moving fruit. Miss Pac-Man required six additional kilobytes of code. So, in order to fit more ROM chips in, Miss Pac-Man conversion kits came with a daughter board. The chip here at position 6B is the main Z80 CPU. You would remove the chip from its slot, insert a ribbon cable connector for the daughter board in its place, and then put the Z80 in the empty slot on that board. This board contained two 4 kilobyte ROM chips, a 2 kilobyte ROM chip, and some programmable array logic chips, or PAL chips. These extra chips are needed to basically tie in the new extra ROM chips. It's a bit more complicated than just dropping them in and mapping them to previously unused memory space. Speaking of the memory space, Pac-Man had a fairly simple memory map. Each of those four program ROM chips were mapped to the start of the 15-bit memory space. So the first chip went from hex 0 to FFF, the second from hex 1000 to 1FFF, and so on up to 3FFF. Hex 4000 through 4FFF held stuff like video RAM, work RAM, while the stuff like the joystick and button inputs, coin box, and watchdog are all in the early hex 5000s. The Miss Pac-Man conversion kit actually came with 10 kilobytes worth of data on it, 
It also makes use of the 16th address line of the Z80, so the address space doubles in size. Thanks to those PAL chips, the 2 kilobyte ROM chip is mapped to hex 8000 through 87FF. One of the 4 kilobyte chips is mapped from hex 8800 to 97FF. And then the other is actually mapped to hex 3000 through 3FFF, completely overshadowing one of the original Pac-Man ROM chips. Now the other three original chips were still visible from 0 to hex 2FFF, but they weren't completely visible. Basically, the PAL chips also implement a sort of patching feature, which allows small chunks of code from the original chips to be replaced by new code in the new chips. It's not unlike how a game genie works, really. If the CPU tries to fetch a byte from a region of ROM that the PAL chips determine to be patched, they will block the read and chip enable signals from passing through to the motherboard, perform a sort of table lookup to convert the old address to a new address on the new ROM chip, and then enable that new chip in its place, effectively injecting the modified code into execution. The reason why this was done in this fashion is due to how code modifications need to be inserted in the first place in software. When you're writing some code and then later on you need to insert something in the middle of what you've already written, it's easy to just make space for it right where it's needed. However, this isn't really possible with assembly code that's already been assembled. Many instructions rely on the exact memory location that certain code ends up at, and by inserting stuff like this, all of those offsets change. You would have to find every instance following the insertion point and update any relevant memory addresses. This is a lot more effort than it's worth when you can do something called a hijack. All you need to do this is put all the code you want to insert somewhere completely different where it won't interfere and shift everything around. Then you only need to put in a single call instruction where that code needs to take place. The only problem is that since a call instruction is 3 bytes long, you can't just insert it. You need to overwrite 3 bytes in order to not shift everything around. If you overwrite a 3 byte instruction, or multiple instructions that add up to 3 bytes, you can then move those instructions into your subroutine so they're preserved in the code. After everything is said and done, here is what a basic hijack modification would look like. This is exactly what this random quadrant calculation subroutine in Ms. Pac-Man is, a hijack. And the hijacks for Inky and Sue show a somewhat annoying property of hijacks, and that they're often not pretty. Even though the same new function is being inserted in four different places, since the instruction being overwritten is different, these locations need different entry points into the hijack in order to preserve them. Let's look at how the ghost's code got hijacked. This function for Blinky starts at hex 2745. In Miss Pac-Man, the get ran quadrant routine is located at hex 9561. This instruction lands at hex 274B, and it is already 3 bytes long, Perfect overwrite. So we can just replace that with the call instruction right away. And actually, since we don't need that old coordinate at all, we don't have to do anything extra. That's it. Pinky's code is basically identical. So now let's look at Sue's code. This starts at hex 2800, and the instruction that actually gets replaced is at 2803. This is also a 3 byte instruction, so that's easy to replace. However, this instruction is the load instruction that fetches Sue's facing direction. We can't outright remove it, so we have to make sure it runs before the hijack function. To fix that, we put this instruction at the start of the new function, and point the call instruction to that instead. All fixed. And for completeness, Inky's code. Inky's code is at hex 27b8, and the instruction in question is at 27BB. This one is overwritten just as easily, but now we need to preserve fetching Inky's facing direction as well. Just tack it on to the start of the hijack function too, may as well. 
However, now we also have to add in a jump instruction so that we don't also fetch Sue's facing direction when we don't want to. This is why this code looked kind of ugly when I presented it in the previous video. Hijacks are definitely not pretty. Now, why were these load instructions the ones that were replaced and not the coordinate loading ones like with Blinky and Pinky? Well, I can't say for certain, but there is one sort of snag with the way the patching feature of the PAL chips works that may have had something to do with it. The PAL chips cannot just patch out individual bytes. They can only patch in groups of 8 bytes. Additionally, those 8 bytes have to align to the 8-byte stride of the memory map. More precisely, the address of the first byte of the 8-byte patch block has to have zeros in its lowest three bits. So for example, hex 1430 and 1438 are valid locations for a patch block, but 1434 and 143F are not. This is just due to the design of the chips. They don't even pay attention to the lowest three bits of the address at all. As an example, here's a bit of code from the original game that was responsible for picking which music track to play. The new code, needing inserted, was too big to fit here, so a hijack was made. Instead of a call instruction, a jump was used instead, and the new routine jumps back elsewhere instead of using a return instruction. Here's the byte code for these instructions. We need to change three bytes here. This function is located at hex 2d59 in the game's ROM. The 8-byte block boundary is right here, one byte into this load instruction. The three bytes we need to change fit nicely into one block, spanning from hex 2d60 to 2d67, with extra bytes to spare on each side. The two bytes at the start of the patch block need to match the original instruction in order for it to be preserved but the last three bytes don't matter since the jump will make sure these don't get executed anyway. So this ends up being one of the patch blocks at hex 2d60. Now, if you look at the address of the instructions that hold the coordinates for the four ghost scatter targets, you can see that this three byte instruction falls perfectly into one of those eight byte blocks for Blinky and for Pinky. But for Inky and Sue, this instruction straddles between two blocks. This means that in order to patch this single instruction, you would need to use up two adjacent patch blocks. Now, is this the reason why the previous instruction was overwritten instead? I don't know, but it's a good guess. The main reason I don't think this is a good reason is because it's very easy to just use two patch blocks to cover the instructions needed. The PAL chips allowed for a total of 64 8-byte patches, and only 40 of them ended up being used for Miss Pac-Man. That leaves 24 patch blocks, which is plenty to afford a few inefficiencies. However, looking at all 40 patch blocks used, none of them are adjacent at all, which is kind of weird. You would expect at least one of them to require replacing an instruction that just happens to cross the 8-byte block boundary. There is one pair at hex 1000 and 1008, but there are two small functions at that location, and so these are basically two separate patches instead of one big one. Another possibility is that it was just an error. Maybe the wrong instruction was replaced by mistake. And since Inky and Sue are the last to come out of the ghost house, the end result just wasn't even noticeable. A third possibility is that Inky and Sue were made to be more random at some point, but then they decided to undo the change, and instead of just removing the patch altogether, they changed it in a way that ended up with this weird hijack that immediately gets overwritten. Who knows? What do you think? Maybe there's yet another option I haven't even thought of. Let me know in the comments. Thank you for watching. If you haven't heard already, Cohost recently shut down, so new articles are still going to be on hiatus. They're still available to read for now, but they're also available on my website. Also, I've made a Blue Sky account at rgmechx.com. I'll be posting updates and announcements there now, so be sure to follow there if you haven't made an account already.